Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub. I don't know how many of you remember Bert Parks. And there she is, Miss America. When many of us were growing up, the Miss America pageant was an annual television extravaganza where a young woman with brains, beauty, and presence would be chosen as an American spokeswoman for the year. And how proud the Jewish community was in 1945 when Bess Meyerson was chosen Miss America, the only Jewish woman to hold that title. Well, Israel has the same pageant, called in Hebrew, Malkat Hayofi. And each year, a new Miss Israel is crowned. And in 2013, a bright, talented, gorgeous young woman made history in the state of Israel when she was chosen to be Miss Israel, for she was the first Miss Israel of the Ethiopian Jewish community. What an honor and kick it is for me to welcome to L'Chaim, Titi Ainau, who since becoming Miss Israel in 2013 has used her celebrity to do enormous good for Israeli society. In addition to her successful modeling career, her work in television, Titi has become a strong Israel advocate, doing extraordinary work for her community. She founded the Titi Project, which provides enrichment programs for Ethiopian children from disadvantaged backgrounds. Titi served as a lieutenant and com company commander in the IDF, and then joined the military police with 300 men and women under her command. Titi is currently studying at the prestigious IDC University in Herzliya, where she's studying international relations. And thanks to the JNF and Media Watch, Titi is in America to speak to students on college campuses, telling her story and telling the truth about Israel. She is quite a woman. It, yeah, I've been looking forward to sitting with you for days and days, ever since oh. I knew you were going to be in New York. First of all, Mazal Tov. Not simply on being chosen, Miss Israel, and that's an accomplishment, and you, sh you should be very proud. But I want you to be proud for the work you're doing on behalf of the Jewish people and the State of Israel. Mazal Tov, and thank you for joining us. Thank I'm you Lechayim. for having me. So there's so much I want to talk to you about. First, a little bit about you. And I know some of your history, the audience does not. So I need you to tell us the story. Um, you were born in Ethiopia. Yes. <clears throat> and you lost your parents at a young age. How mm -hmm. young were you? Um, I lost my father when I was two, um, and my mom when I was nine. That's very young. It's hard on a child, don't you think? It's very hard. Yes. Yeah. You have a brother? Yeah, one older brother. OK. And at one point, you and your brother come to Israel to join your grandparents. Yeah. OK. How do you get to Israel? How does that happen? What's going on in your life that one day they say to you, what's your brother's name? Yirak. He, he, so he says to you, your brother and you, you're going to Israel. How does that happen? So in our house, uh, I growing up with my grandparents and my mom, we, we all the time talk about Jerusalem. Do you? Yeah, yeah. Since I born, I know that I am Jewish, and our goal was to move to Israel. So we know how that in some point in my life that we will move to Israel. We didn't know when exactly, uh, but it was our dream. You know, as a young girl, as a kid, I, you know, Girls dream to be princess, and yes. you know, I dream to move to Israel. It was really? my dream. Yes, yes. It was what did my you, Titi? What did you know about Israel, or what had you been told? So I didn't know nothing about Israel. I know about Israel from the Bible, and what I saw about Israel, and this is what I'm talking about when I'm speaking in front of the students. It's 
really negative things. All I saw about Israel from the TV was war, tanks, soldiers. But when I used to call to my grandparents and talk to them, they tell me, no, it's not like this. You know, it's right, it's different. So beside the fact it was my dream to move to Israel, and no matter what, I, I will move. Uh, but I didn't know enough about Israel. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very honest. But still, tell me, does it happen in a phone call? Does somebody come to your house and say, you're going to go to Israel now? How do you learn you're going to go to Israel? So my grandparents, uh, so my, my aunt, she moved with the, she came to Israel with a portion uh, Salman, and she write all our family. Uh, all the Jewish family, like she, 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 she write all our family, and we prepare. I don't know. It's like uh, some process that I don't know to explain exactly. I but see. my grandparents move, and then they signed us, and then we move after them. So we basically we lived in in Ethiopia. I know that it's a temporary time, you know. As you look back on your childhood. Would you say you had a, ch a hard childhood? Well, it it's depends, because if I will compare it to this life, so I will say, yes, I had really, really tough childhood. You know, I, I, never sh I, didn't, sh I didn't have shoes until 12. And I had only two dresses. And I had really, really tough childhood because I lost my parents. But at the same time, I would say this is what makes me who I am today, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. uh, this toughness, you know, I, was, I used to wake up in the morning and, and people like kids in my age would go to the school and I would go to the sheep, to the cows, or running in the jungle, you know. So it's, it's really, really different. I feel sometimes that I lived in two different worlds, yes. you know, and I'm 27. Yes. And I would say, yeah, I had a had tough childhood, but... At the same time, I, I will say thank you for that because this is, this is make me the person who I am. That's a very wonderful attitude. You come to Israel. Yeah. Is it a culture shock for you? Oh, uh, it, was, it was shocking for me. In what you know? way? First of all, I didn't know how Israel looked like because we didn't have internet. We come from the village. I didn't know too much about Israel. So... The first time that I get out from the plane, all I saw was these buildings, everything fast, and you know everything huge. You know when you're watching the future movie and it looked like so robotic and so weird, and you didn't understand. And I was in shock. I was mm -hmm, in shock mm -hmm. with so many many ways. Uh, it was like my first time that I had my own room, my grandparents' house, oh. and my first time that I had like that I need to wear shoes, I need to wear every day, like, and I need to change my, my clothes every day. It's like everything was huge for me, you know. Computer was real and new for me, and I got my own phone, and yeah. Was it scary in any way? Were a little bit in the beginning, but I have my family around me, and they help me. And what the scary part was to go to the school and not knowing one, one word in Hebrew, you know. Oh, you knew no Hebrew. I didn't know Hebrew. When you look back on it, isn't that amazing what you were able to do? You know, most people, when they're dropped into another culture and they don't know the language, they're just lost and they stay lost. Yeah. You were dropped into this Israeli culture, and Hebrew is the only... You had to learn Hebrew, and you did. How did. hard was that for you? Uh, so I was uh, lucky because I come with, you know, really young, 12, so you learn very fast. Um, I teach myself Hebrew, or ev everybody in my class around me already spoke Hebrew, and I didn't go to the Ulpan, I go to regular class, because I didn't want to stay two years in Ulpan, and then, you know, to beginning, I want to just, you know, jump to the... Right in, you want yeah, to jump right in. Yeah, and... Three months take for me to understand and to talk, but to read and write, it take one year and a half, something like that. I teach myself Hebrew to kindergarten books, teach myself in a library, and yeah, I work hard. That's wonderful. How did your brother do? He 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 was in Ulpan, so 
he had really, really uh, easy, he doing great, yeah, but, you know, he, he, he learned and he was somebody that helped him. Uh, but I was, I was alone with this process, so for me it was much more harder than oh, him. Okay. Um, help me understand the community you're in with your grandparents. Yeah. Is it a community that had come from Ethiopia? Were you in some way in a community of people that you knew and had similar experiences? Or were you thrown into a general Israeli population? So I will say uh, everybody in Israel are immigrants, you know? Uh, and it doesn't matter which community, we are all of us moved to Israel, so we feel with each other, you know? And we know the struggles of each other. And we understand each other. So we all my community move to, to, to Israel and we try to live uh, in the same area, mm -hmm. but in the same time we live with the other communities together. For example, my neighborhood, my, my, my buildings, you know, my grandparents' house, uh, in front of us was um, Moroccan and, and Russian, so it's, it's a lot, it's mixed. Yes. Yeah. In the school you were in, if I saw you in class, was your entire class made up of young people from Ethiopia, or were they Israelis in general from all communities? Mixed. It was a mix. I have the lucky to, to just, you know, because I didn't go to the Olpan and I go to regular class, so everybody around me are already, you know, Israeli. That half of them moved a year before me and half of them born okay. there. So it was mixed. Okay. So one of the things we learned, and again, you did not come in the first wave of Ethiopian Jews. You're coming later. Yeah. When the first wave of Ethiopian Jews came to Israel, there were all kinds of problems that they faced. Yeah. Social problems. The religious establishment gave them all kinds of trouble. In any, in any way, did you face social problems? To what extent did other students, were, were people nice to you? Were other students nice to you? Or was there ever an issue made that you were from Ethiopia? Uh, I think I'm not a good example to answer for these questions because I really had the lucky to be with a round of amazing people in my class that helped me to learn the language and they was with me all the way. But I would say um, there is kind of the discrimination that my community deal with uh, being a, as an Ethiopian Jewish. And if I will compare it to the first uh, wave that came to, to Israel, and I would say they had a lot of struggles because they right. come from the village without education, without nothing. So for them, every, for, for, for them everything was new. But for us, as a young and, and a people that born in Israel, for us, it's much more easier because like half Israeli. Mm -hmm. We are half Israeli mm -hmm. and, and we know how to deal with things. And we, we study and, and you know, we, we have education. We are, we have, um, we are lawyers, accountants and everything. So I would say the first web have really a lot of struggle. And still today we have struggle, yes. you know. Yes. And, but the amazing thing of being in Israel or moving to Israel is the fact that you can change things, that you can, if you have problem, because we have a democratic country, we can go and protest and, and change and move things. And, and the, our struggle is the same struggle that people before us struggle with, Russian, Yemen, Moroccan, everybody, even the Ashkenazi. Mm -hmm. even, even uh, there was the first people that come in here, uh, but every every community in Israel and every immigrant deal with the same thing that we're dealing with today. Mm -hmm. You know, when Ethiopians first came to Israel, they were called falasha. Yeah. And then we learned that that was not a good word. No. Correct. No, it's a bad word. It's <laughs> a bad word. It was, it was an unfortunate. It was unfortunate that that word was ever used. And the other issue is that the Orthodox rabbinate in Israel questioned the Jewish legitimacy of the first Jews from Ethiopia. 
to what extent have you had to deal with any kind of, are you Jewish or you're not Jewish, wh what? So um, this is a question that um, the, 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 the Orthodox rabbis still today question us because, um, you know, it's really sad. Yes. Uh, because we lived in the villages in Ethiopia as a Jewish alone, you know. And I will tell you a funny story. Because we was Jewish and we don't want to, to marry any people that they are not Jewish. So for me, for example, when I was six, people come from other villages to ask my, my grandfather to, you know, when I will be growing up to marry me to someone that, you know, from other village, but he's Jewish, you know. So for us to be Jewish in Ethiopia was the most important thing, you know. And we leave everything in Ethiopia to move to Israel. And Felashites mean it's the name that the, the Ethiopian Christian gave it to us. It means Avengers, like people that doesn't belong to the place. So we belong to Israel and coming in Israel and having this question from these rabbis, it's hurt, but... You know, today uh, we have the, recently, the, um, our rabbis, our community rabbis that call case, uh, so they prove them to be our formal rabbis in our community. And there is some question sometimes, but we deal with that really good, I think. We fight with that and, and you know, it's sad, but we all know we are Jewish and we're proud of that. I think the answer to you, I don't know. Beautifully. <laughs> Did it make you angry? Does it make you angry? Does it make people in your community angry? It does. It doesn't make us angry. There is people that all the time will question. There is people that the Orthodox people were questioning about the Reformed Jewish, that they are not Absolutely. enough Jewish, right? Uh, right. So this is the people that we don't listen to. Good you for know? you. Good for you. I mean, it's interesting. The Jews of Ethiopia have made this extraordinary contribution. And there is still, sadly, from my perspective, there's sad, it's sad that there are Jews who, by the way, have their own perspective and they're entitled to their own perspective. But they want to minimize who you are and who Reformed Jews are. And here you are, you're serving in the IDF. You are, it's not just that you're Miss Israel. You're studying now in one of the top universities in the world, a very complicated- Is that in the world? In the world. Really? In the world. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. You're studying one of the top universities in the world, and you're studying a serious topic, and you're going to make a contribution. You've already made a contribution. You're going to make a contribution. And there are people who still, there are still people in Israel who want to, in some way, make you less of an Israeli, or even worse, less of a Jew. The thing, it's small. The thing is that a small community or small of groups that question in this question. You're about right. That. And we don't let them to questioning uh, the fact that we are Jewish, to questioning the fact that my grandparents give everything to move to Israel yes. and they live and keep all the mitzvot and all the Torah. We don't really care about them, you know. We do. There is all the time negative people that even in your life will try to push yes. you, no matter if this is religion or not. We don't, I don't want to give them a place, you know, to talk about, about them because they don't worth it. Good you know? for you. So for me, they don't exist. It's just like a background noise that okay. I'm hearing. Good for you. So you go to high school, yes? And I don't know how to ask this question exactly. I'm just going to ask it. At some point, people recognize that all the, for all the things that go into Titi, you also are beautiful, and they want you to do modeling. You begin with a modeling career, correct? Not in the high school. After high school? Is after it after the, IDF? I, after you go to the, the IDF, IDF yeah. Not to, so when you're in the IDF, you're in, well, which branch of the service are you? What part of the IDF? The military police. You're uh, do you start in the military, please? So, uh, 
Yeah, we, we belong, my, my unit belongs to military police, but our job is not really the military police What job. was your job? My, my soldier's job was to be in the checkpoints in Jerusalem that check in every day all the Palestinians that come in inside to Israel and go out. Kidi, you were at the checkpoints? Yeah. Wow. But because we deal with, a, um, with people that they are not in the army, so we need to be a police. To, 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 to have the permission to deal with them, you know, with I the understand. Palestinians. So because of that, we belong to military, to military police. Okay. But my job was to train my soldiers to be soldiers, first of all, and then to be professional soldiers in the checkpoints. As you look back at it, how would you describe the experience you had in the IDF? Was it a, was it a good experience or was it a hard experience? Uh, definitely hard experience, uh, not easy at all, because I also was in, uh, in boys' platoon, and I was the only female one in my platoon. And to be a female in boys' unit, it's really, really hard. Didi, how did that happen? How did it happen? I will tell you. Um, first, my platoon was boys and girls, and when I came back from the, the um, officer school, they decide that uh, the boys would go to be in the checkpoints with the, you know, to be in the d dangerous places. Uh, and because I had really good grades from the officer schools, they asked me if I want, I they asked me if I want to go to the boys' platoon. <laughs> and actually they say you can choose. And I say, come on, it's not even a question for me, you know, because of course I will want to be a lieutenant of boys, you know. <laughs> it's, I all the time say that it's much more fun to say what to do to boys than girls in the army. So this is how I got there. But my job uh, was to make sure that my soldiers will do the best they can to protect our board. Because in that checkpoint, it can be very, very dangerous. Uh, because the Israeli government give the permission to the Palestinians to come inside to Israel and go out every day to work. So there's people that, really normal people that want, just want to come and work and put some food to their family table. And sometimes you can deal with the terrorists with the knife bomb. So uh, my job was really seriously to make sure that my soldiers will, will do the best they can to protect our people. You know, I mentioned already, the reason you're here in the United States is to speak on college campuses. Yeah. You were here for two weeks, correct? Yeah. How many campuses did you visit? At this time, 16, I think. You, yeah. In two weeks, you were at 16 yeah, campuses. Yeah, I'm running around. My <laughs> good, they have you running. <laughs> they keep me busy. Okay. How many students do you think you spoke to? I have no idea. Hundreds. You spoke to, okay. So, and they got to ask you questions, correct? Yeah. Okay. You know, in America, there are people who are very critical yeah. of Israeli checkpoints. Take down the checkpoints. Why should they be there? They are a brutalization, a humili humiliation of the Palestinian. They are not done with kindness. They're done sort of mean. In your experience, based on your experience, what do you say to people who would ask you, why doesn't Israel take down the checkpoints? And when you hear people criticize them, what are your thoughts and what are your feelings? Uh, what they don't understand that this is checkpoints exist because uh, basically the people that are passing the checkpoints are not Israeli citizens. And the effect that the Israeli government gives them to pass these two checkpoints into work, it means they, they give work opportunity. If we will close that board, they will not work, you know? They will know food, they will know nothing. So, based of my experience, I all the time say <clears throat> to my soldiers, respect and suspect. Because in the end of the day, people can talk and they can say, you know, from the news, they don't know what's going on there. Because in the end of the day, we are the regular people that pass in there. We are okay with them. Mm -hmm. We are, you know, there is like people that passing their years and years, 
and and they come and they will say hello to soldiers and my soldiers will say hi and you know we have kind of a relationship with them and you only see the bad things in the news mm -hmm. and my soldiers I all the time it was really important for me as a person as an immigrant to educate them and to say you know you need to respect these people and they always do that we always do there is no if if we don't have you know if this is not dangerous situation we don't have we don't need to be mean to anybody mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. You know, people don't know what's going on there. So it's really easy to talk from the outside. Yes. And you don't see all the pictures, you know. You don't see the full picture. And it's complicated to explain even, you know, for me. But I can say that I will first teach my soldiers to respect and, and, and to honor the people. Because in the end of the day, we are all human, you know. Mm -hmm. Were there incidents where you did deal with people trying to smuggle some kind of explosive or weapon into Israel? So um, my, soldier, my soldiers deal, not me specifically, because I was in the base. I was in the training base. Did they have to deal with this? Uh, yeah, many times. You know. Many times. Yeah. 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 Um, in general, are you proud of the ethic of the IDF. Yeah. When you hear, again, there are American Jews and Americans every now and then who just want to say that the IDF does not have enough compassion or, you know, we see the United Nations always coming up with horrible resolutions so that at the Gaza border, Israelis are accused of trying to kill children and doctors and people with, with, who, are, who have physical disabilities. Is that true? And how do you feel when you hear this? Uh, it's, it's not true for, for my experience from the things that I know. Um, it's the opposite because Israel, when in Lebanon or Syria something happened, they run into the board and we open our board and give a medical a treatment Aid, yeah. to the uh, citizens that they are not our citizens. And the soldiers there, you know, there is pictures that you cannot see that even in Yerushalayim that uh, somebody like stand and call and they come and like, you know, so just come and hug them. And this is the pictures that you cannot see. That we never see those pictures. Is, no, never. And that the soldiers give their food in Ramallah and this to, to, the, to the kids, you know, that they're walking around there. But I think people think that the Israel is strong and it, it, this is the strong side, so it's much more easier for them to curtize and, and say, Yes. This thing that they say, yes. and from my experience, and as an officer in the army, I will proud to say that the first thing that I'm learning in my in my, you know, Training? learning as an officer, yeah. one year, it's it's to be human and to treat people as equal, no matter who who stand in front of you. So I know what I learn. I know what I teach my soldiers, and I will say. It's not the way, and this is the thing that you just see in the news. And, you know, I don't want to go there too much, but it's all the time when I watch the news here, I see that they film only the Gaza side. They don't film what's happening in the road. That's how kids, you know, wake up every day for, and going to the shelters because there's bombs. So it's complicated, you know. It's not something that I can... Uh, it's not something that people can say, oh, this is like this, it's like this. It's much more bigger. And for me, I would like to live in the world that we don't need yes, the army. Absolutely. And we will live in harmony. This is like my dream, you know. Yes. But I can say and, and, and proudly say that my soldiers and me are, you know, 
really responsible and try to do the best as we can for the both sides. Do you hate Palestinians? No. <laughs> it's a silly question, isn't it? Yeah. It's silly. You <laughs> I love the way you answered it. Do your soldiers hate Palestinians? No. 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 Uh, we don't we don't we don't hate people. And um, we are more than friends than people know. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. uh, we are more than friends that people outside from Israel know. Because they only say the negative things. Yes, yes. And no, it's, 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 not, it's not like this. Okay. And I, I don't hate. Okay. We don't hate them. Okay. One last question in this area. So were the men soldiers who were under you, did they give you extra grief because you were a woman? I was... Ex and I give them, uh, you know, I was their, their lieutenant, so they didn't give me nothing. <laughs> I, I was the chief. <laughs> uh, but I was really t a tough one, so. Okay. But you see so sweet. It's hard for me to it's imagine. It's now. <laughs> <laughs> when I am with my soldiers and like with the officer mode, I'm a different person. <laughs> Very good. Is there racism? in Israel. Did you experience racism because you're black? I will say uh, there is discrimination in Israel, but not twice as because in Israel we are all Jewish and we don't have one type of Jewish, one type of color of Jewish. We all have Moroccan, they yes. are like yeah. more like Yemen. Yes. They are like so race doesn't exist in Israel. Okay. Discrimination, yes. Where? Where's the discrimination? The, the discrimination can be in my community, and guess my community. And discrimination can be like, uh, in and guess of the Russian also, because there's uh, some people that Russian that was doctor in Russia and they they clean streets in Israel, you know. So it's happened because I can explain that in one way. Uh, it's not easy to open your doors every couple of years to, to new culture, to new immigrants. So I will say that it's happening because they don't know enough about our culture or, or about the people that come in. So they did a little bit trouble for you. But in the end of the day, um, you know, I, w I will describe that in the other way. There is really small movie that can describe the society in Israel. It's a seven minute movie, black and white. And it's filmed in, in, in the port in Haifa. And when the port come, the, and when the boat come to the port, you can see the first person, the first people that going down from that, uh, that boat was the Ashkenazi Jewish. And you can see them start build the country. And then come the Sephardic. So the Ashkenazi Jewish says to the Sephardic, why you come now, we already built this country. And the Sephardic Jews, and then after the Sephardic, come the Moroccan. So the Sephardic Jews say to the Moroccan, we built already this country, why you come now? You know, so, and, he, and you know, and then the Yemen, and then the, the Moroccan did the same thing to the Yemen. Yemen. So I would say it's, a, it's kind of a, a new, every new immigrant, people that come in, they deal with some problems. Yes. Not because the rice is, just because they are new. Yes. You know? You say and it so <laughs> well. Yeah. It's the paradox of Israel, because you said it both yeah. say. Yeah. In one way, Israel embraces everybody. They're all Jewish. Yeah. And at the same time, every community is going to say to the other community, hey, listen. But in the end of the day, what's amazing about us, it's the fact that if I need any help, yes. I, I write one post in Facebook, and Everybody gonna be in my salon and help me, you know. And even even in the road, my 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 car is stuck, and they will maybe pissed, but still they will come and and help me, you know. Mm -hmm. And this is us. We we live with each other, that small country, and supporting each other. Beautiful. Okay, you come out of the IDF. Yeah. <laughs> and then you start modeling. And then my best friend sent me out to Mrs. Rabudi context. And then I went, and then I started modeling. Okay. <laughs> you model before you win. No. You win first? 
Yeah. Just let me get this straight. You come out of the IDF and you enter the Miss Israel contest and you win. Yeah. Out of nowhere. By the way, <laughs> it sounds fabulous. Um, all of a sudden, you're not only in a beauty contest, you're not only in the Miss Israel beauty contest, you win. Do you remember that night? Yeah. What uh, was it like? I will remember it. Tell oh, me. It was crazy because uh, it, it was not my dream. I was a tomboy. And it was my best friend's dream. And all these years, we're talking, she talked about that. So she sent me up uh, to the competition. And I go for her and I go for the car because the, the car is, is the prize. So. I never thought to be a beauty queen, uh, and you know, to be like three years in the, and half in the army, you become half men, you know? <laughs> you're not the, the typical type. You're not delicate, of, uh, you know, you're yeah. not a del delicate feminine woman. Yeah, and for me, it was, you know, in the beginning, it was just like ch challenge, you know? What and did you have to do in the contest? So first for me was to learn everything from zero because I didn't to work with heels. I didn't know to work at all with heels and to do makeup and hair to the photo shoots. Uh, it was a really cool experience. It was four months of auditioning and it was a really good one. But uh, when I won and that night, it was crazy. It was really crazy because for me it was exciting to win and for my community, of course, but it, what, it, it was much more bigger for Israel because then people, BBC from here, CNN, and everybody from Europe, start to come and film, like, to interview me and, and, and learn about Israel through me, through my story, learn about, you know, I go to Rome uh, and they had one big, big channel, like, huge one that everybody watch. And they didn't know there is Ethiopian Jewish. And they take movie and they tell about the oppression Moses, oppression Solomon. And they, so it was huge for me and it was huge for Israel too, you know. That's so. marvelous. Has, it was for a year, correct? Yeah. For one year. Yeah. And you went all over? You were, amb you were an, an ambassador for the state of Israel for yeah. that year. Yeah, I, I, I did. Okay. Ultimately, I want to talk for one moment about what you're doing here. Because I want to know first, what did the students want to know from you most? What's the kind of question you got over and over again? Um, the surprise, uh, first of all, I would like to say that I'm doing that already three years with JNF. Media Watch, and we're doing first, you know, Russell, the Robinson. Russell Robinson, heads yeah. JNF. When he came, yeah, the head of JNF, and when he came and he told me, I want you to do that, I didn't know what we're going to do, you know, and we start to do these tours, and I start with the high, you know, in Harvard, in Yale, in Wharton, and people was, they all the time want to know more about the army, this is the weird part. Because like, I'm not supposed to talk too much about army, but they're like when they hear about me and be a lieutenant, and and they want to know about the and Jewish, they want to know the, if there is rises or if the Israel it's apartheid country, uh, and guess my community too. And many times they come with they come to me with uh, videos of uh, BDS and not real videos, and they show me. This is happening in the Israeli army. And I'm like, no, I'm sorry to say this is not our uniform. This is not our soldiers. Um, so they have really, really a lot of questions, a lot. Um, what's going on? They don't know nothing. You know, it's for me. I born. I, I like the big part of my life. I am in Israel, and I didn't realize how much people don't know enough about Israel that I know. You know, it's uh, Israel that I'm growing up too. So they have a lot of questions, and they are, I have 
lucky because only once they did a protest against me. Uh, but most of the time I have been like having over 70 colleges. You know, it's a lot. And they did a cappella and sing for me. <laughs> <laughs> and I have really great experience doing that. Okay, I want to ask the question the other way. Okay. What surprised you? It may be that you've already said it, that you were surprised at how ignorant American students are, and for that matter, Americans in general about Israel. But I wondered whether something surprised you, whether you, whether you learned something from the students about who American Jews are that either pleased you or disappointed you. So uh, the groups that I'm meeting not, not are um, only Jewish. Yes. The smallest group are like Jewish, but the largest group yes. are regular uh, Christian, I yeah, would say. Yeah, the students from all across. Yeah. So everything so su surprised me. Um, first of all, about the, the American Jewish, I am really, 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 we are as a country, as Israel, are lucky to have this support system that we have from the Jewish here. Because uh, Israel can, cannot exist without the help from, you know, uh, American Jewish. But what surprised me um, for a good from the, the Jewish student that they, how much they are really want to know and how much they are connected to Israel. Even they don't know enough, but they are connected, they go, to different, they, they want to ask me, they come to ask me if they, if, they, if they recommend to come, that they will come to visit in Israel. And they are really involved, the, those that I meet. And what surprised me about non-Jewish groups that they, are, they, know, they don't know nothing about Israel, like in the sad way, but in the same time, I love the fact that they are open to hear my story and to learn you know, about Israel. Even they, sometimes I have students that don't really agree with me, and they come and ask me questions, sometimes tough questions, but they still come in, in interesting. And this is something that I'm really happy to achieve because I think I have the opportunity just a little bit to change their mind. Absolutely. It's a wonderful contribution you're making. So, Titi, do you have a boyfriend? No. <laughs> How is that possible? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, so everybody should know if they're living in Israel watching this, because yeah. this is also shown in Israel. Titi has no boyfriend. I have one more personal question for you. You have one tattoo on your body. The tattoo is Emmet. Yeah. Why Emmet? So um, I compete in the Israeli version of Survivor. Ah, oh, that's right. VIP, yeah. I almost won. I lost for one voice, by the way. You should uh, have won. Yeah, I know. I, th <laughs> I think so, too. <laughs> uh, but... You are a tomboy. You're crazy. I am. You're, you're nuts. I am you a know. tomboy. You're nuts. You know that. I'm not a typical beauty queen. No, I know you're, not, no, you're, not. <laughs> you're, the, you're the best beauty queen. Why Emmet? I just want to uh, remind myself to be... Uh, to chief, um, how do I say that? To be uh, truthful, real, and truthful to, to yourself myself and to the others. And the reason that I tattoo it in my hand, because I will, I want to remember it when I'm looking at it all the time, you know. And in that game, I I didn't lie to anybody and I didn't cheat and I was like really strong and believing myself. Even it was really. The one, one of the hardest things that I did in my life. And I want to remember to myself that I, I did that there and I can do it all over my life, you know, to be true and strong and believe in myself. 
I can't tell you how wonderful it has been Thank for me to meet you. Thank you very much. Thank you And I wanted to meet you, but I, I could never have imagined you this wonderful. You are spectacular. Oh. What you're doing for the State of Israel is so wonderful. Thank you. I wish you kol tuva hatzlacha everywhere you go. And I know you'll Amen. do wonderful, wonderful things. And you'll come back to America. When you come back Amen. to America, I hope you'll sit with me again. I will. Okay. I will come visit Thank you. Thank you, darling. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Didi Enau, the first Ethiopian-born Miss America, crowned in 2013 a most remarkable human being. I hope you've enjoyed meeting her as much as I have. Thank you. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have to any of the ideas expressed on this edition of L'Chaim. Please email me, write me, post on our Facebook page, or tweet me. I look forward to hearing from many of you. And please remember to check out our L'Chaim podcast and listen to L'chaim wherever you go. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'chaim, my friends, to life. education in media. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.